A wise person once said, the world can be a nasty place. You know it. I know it. Yeah. We don't have to fall from grace. Put down the weapons you fight with. Your lies are bullets. Your mouth's a gun. No war and anger has ever won. Put out the fire before igniting. Next time you're fighting. Kill him with kindness. Kill him with kindness. Kill him with kindness. Kill him with kindness. Go ahead now. Selena Gomez wrote this song, Kill Him With Kindness. This is what she has to say about it. She says, I think people need to realize that their words are so meaningful. I will have such a heavy conscience if I retaliate all the hate that I get. Trust me, I want to, but I do feel like that's always been the best thing for me, turning the other cheek. I know it's so much easier to be mean, maybe more fun sometimes, but being able to wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and know that you gave them your best when they were coming at you with their worst. You just have to kill them with kindness. The fifth commandment is found in Exodus 20, 13, and says, you shall not murder. Like You can murder someone by killing them or without killing them, with your hatred and your anger. But God and Selena Gomez are calling you to a higher standard. Let's combat hate with love. This commandment is repeated many times in the New Testament and it applies to our lives today. Today we're talking about two ways to murder someone and how love kills them with kindness. So the first way to murder someone is physically. This is the way that we all know of, like when you take someone's life, like they're alive and now they're dead. In the Bible, there is a difference between killing and murder. Killing is taking someone's life on purpose, accidentally, immorally, morally, for whatever reason, any reason. When you or someone causes someone else to die, that is killing. Murder is different. Murder is on purpose and immoral. You don't accidentally murder someone. You choose to. And we don't say, oh, the man was murdered in a work accident. No, he was killed accidentally. Murder is on purpose. So there are lots of heavy and controversial topics and questions on this subject of murder. So buckle up. All right. In the context of when this commandment was given, differentiating killing from murder. So in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, killing someone is morally allowed for a couple reasons, where it's not murder, it's killing. So we aren't going to go in depth on all these topics. We're going to touch on them, some pretty heavy stuff. We could do a whole sermon on each of these topics. So the first reason why killing killing was morally allowed in the Old Testament was the death penalty. So in Exodus 21, 12, for example, it says, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. So of all the 613 Old Testament laws, there's only one law that appeared in all five books of the law. And it was this one, where if someone murders someone, the murderer shall be put to death with the death penalty. So the death penalty was also used for many other things. For example, if a man has sex with an animal, he should be put to death. Or if someone cheats on their fiance, or if you disobey your parents, you should be put to death. So in the Old Testament, the death penalty was not murder. Like we are not under the Old Testament law because of Jesus' death on the cross. His blood was shed for you, and he's given us a new way to live. So, But from the Old Testament law, we can see how serious it is to disobey God. And in the New Testament, we see in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. Death forever in hell. And the death penalty of the Old Testament is a picture of the death penalty for every person who does not accept Jesus as their savior from sin because the consequences of sin is 
the death penalty. So Christians today are divided on whether the death penalty is moral or immoral for governments today. Like, can a government decide to use the death penalty for whatever reasons they choose fit according to their government? That's the question. And I can see um, reasons for both sides throughout the Bible. And I personally uh, do not have a stance right now, but I need to study this more and take a stance. So the second morally allowed reason to kill someone in the Old Testament is self-defense. Exodus 22, 2 and 3 says this, If a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and killed in the process, the person who killed the thief is not guilty of murder. But if it happens in daylight, the one who killed the thief is guilty of murder. So again, we are not under this Old Testament law, but we can see how God differentiates between killing and murder. There is a difference. And God allowed killing a thief in self-defense, specifically in the daytime and, or in the nighttime. And self-defense at night was not murder in the Old Testament. And in January, when there was the shooting at Diamond Head, the crazy man was trying to murder people, and he did murder people. What are we to do? Are we just to allow him to murder people? Or do we try to stop him by possibly killing him? Stop him, right? I think self-defense is justifiable if you or someone else's life's in danger. And the Bible gives us wisdom and how to handle certain situations. The third morally allowed reason to kill in the Old Testament was in war. God led his chosen people, the Israelites, into many wars. Like God actually gave them battle plans and strategies to fight their wars. And God actually showed up to Joshua in person in Joshua 5.14. And God called himself the commander of the army of the Lord. Like in these wars, people were killed and it was not sinful. Today, we serve that same God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8. And today, wars are fought. These wars aren't commanded by God like they were in the Old Testament. But there is evil in the world today that needs to be stopped. And there is self-defense on a larger scale. The Bible never condemns the actions of a soldier for following the orders of his commander in the battlefield. And according to what the Bible says, killing in war is not murder. So according to the Old Testament law, according to what the Old Testament of the Bible says, um, there's exceptions for killing. Or, yeah, so the death penalty, self-defense, and killing in war are not murder. So everyone here today has not been murdered because you are alive. And you're watching right now. But I know some of you have friends or family members that have been murdered. They've been immorally killed on purpose by someone. And that must be so tough. Like, I cannot even imagine how sad you are right now. Just talking about this topic that you know your friend, your family member was murdered. It's just so sad. And then... It's a lot to go through. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, There are six things the Lord hates. Hands that kill the innocent are one of those things the Lord hates. Those seven things, hands that kill the innocent is one of those things. God hates what happened to your friend or family member. And God knows how you feel. God feels for you. God's son, Jesus, was murdered. God knows exactly how you feel. Jesus was not killed. Jesus was murdered. Jesus was completely innocent and killed on purpose. That is murder. God knows how it feels like to have a family member murdered. And God is with you. And he is compassion and empathy for you right now because he went through the same thing. 
God is your strength in your weakness. You are strong. Psalm 94, 21 says, The wicked band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. So when I think of condemning the innocent to death, I think of abortion. Since 1973, our American government has bonded together to legally allow the murder of babies. Why do people think babies deserve to die? Murder is immoral and on purpose. Abortion is immoral and on purpose. Since 1973, over 60 million babies have been aborted in America alone. Even if you don't think a baby inside the womb is a baby, you have to at least admit that if you murder a baby, you are preventing that baby from having a life like you have. Aren't you glad that your mom and dad did not abort you? Abortion is murder. The first murder happened in Genesis 4, the fourth chapter in the Bible, that soon. And Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. And Cain killed Abel because he was angry that God liked Abel's offering more. So if you go to Genesis 4, 2 through 10, you look this up quick. Uh, Genesis 4, 2 through 10. It says, Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. So take note of this, like, Cain was very angry. And God doesn't explain why he liked Abel's offering better. But some reason that we don't know, Cain knew. He messed up. God let him know. Continues, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will, not be ex- will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must rule over it. Notice, God warns Cain that his anger can lead to sinful actions. It's crouching over him. Like when you're angry, your anger is crouching over you, leading you on farther down to do sinful actions. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Hey, let's go out to the field. While they're in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. Then the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. God knew. Cain gave in to the crouching anger and it led to action. It led to murder, the worst that it gets. And 1 John 3.12 says, we should not be like Cain who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. In the words of Larry Boy from VeggieTales, in the Angry Eyebrows episode, when you hold on to your anger, your anger will, will hold on to you. The second way to murder someone is in your heart. Matthew 5, 21 and 22 says, Jesus was saying this, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, or you idiot, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool! will be in danger of fire of hell. Anger doesn't only lead to murder. Anger is murder. In this new way of life that Jesus gives to us, the commandment, thou shall not murder, is expanded to murder in the heart. 
First John 3.15 says, Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. So most of you have probably not murdered someone physically, but we all have murdered someone in our hearts. All of us have. And we are helpless, deserving hell because of this, if we have not accepted Jesus as our Savior from sin. And hate and anger, hate and anger are best friends. The intense, passionate feelings of dislike aimed at someone or something, when you can't find parking, when you get left on red, when lockdown is getting too long, when someone flicks you off, when something doesn't go your way or someone wrongs you. It's so tempting to freak out, to swear, to use some sign language, to get violent or beat someone up. We might understand like, oh, I can totally understand how murder in the heart leads to murder in the person. And Galatians 5.20 says, Fits of anger are works of the flesh, the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. Proverbs 14.29 says, People with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. Psalm 37.8 says, Stop being angry. Stop it. Turn from your rage. Have you ever raged before? Oh. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath. Soft answer. But a harsh word stirs up anger in the pot. It's really easy to let our anger just stir and boil, yeah, till harsh words come out. We do harm to others. It's harder to give a soft response and to control our anger. Um, we end up hurting those we love. And that feels horrible. Or hurting a random person emotionally or physically. And I'm an introvert. I'm a peacemaker. Enneagram 9, as I've told you all before. The personality test. You may have never seen me angry, but I do get angry and I do hate. I just keep it inside. And sometimes it boils up and I stir it and stir it. Maybe every couple of months or years and I'll just burst off and I'll just be like, and I'll just like punch my pillow, go all crazy on it. I think I can get along with anyone. Like as a peacekeeper, that's my goal to get along with everyone. It's like one of my motivating, motivating drives. And I think everyone should get along with everyone. Everyone should be able to, I think. But as I've gotten to know more people through my years, I've realized there's a certain type of person that I have trouble getting along with. It's Enneagram 8s. I listened to this podcast a couple months ago, and it said Enneagram 9s have trouble getting along with Enneagram 8s. They're the kryptonite sometimes, stereotype. But Enneagram 8s, these types of people are known as the challenger. They are assertive, confrontational, direct, and seek control. Me as a peacemaker, I hate confrontation. I hate <laughs> confrontation. And I hate conflict. I just want to maintain my inner peace. I want to make sure everyone around me is doing okay, is doing great. I want, everyone's at peace. We're all at peace. So I feel, like, I feel like some eights come in and they just want to start something. And they like to uh, just get something get some conflict going, stirring it up, you know. Not, they may not be as considerate of other people's feelings as I am. But if you're an eight, I'm sorry. <laughs> I get along with eights. There, there's been a couple throughout the years, just a few, that I've really struggled getting along with. And I don't express my anger or my hate. I've got a pretty good grasp on it, controlling it. But instead, I choose not to love these people which is wrong. First John 4, 19 through 21 says, We love because he, he, God, first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So God is calling us, not to hate, but he's also calling us to 
love. And sometimes it's easy for me to hold grudges also, yeah? Like sometimes you'd never know I'm actually mad at you because I won't express it. But on the inside, I haven't forgiven you. And I hold that. And it hurts me more than it hurts you. And I haven't forgiven these people on the inside or moved past the issue. And Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That's what Cain did. He let this pot stir and boil. He went to sleep angry and he gave opportunity to the devil. And that's when the hate in his heart turned to action. Murder in the heart to murder in the person. But if you look at this verse, it says, Be angry and do not sin. So is anger always sinful? It seems not. So in Matthew 12, you know, Jesus was going through the temple, flipping tables because they were like selling stuff in the temple. Jesus is like, oh, no, this is the worship place. This is the church, bro. And Psalm 103, 8 and 9 says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. So God is slow to anger, which means God does get angry. He's just slow to get there. And he doesn't remain angry forever. So God does not hold grudges. But we anger God all the time. But if we have accepted Jesus as our personal Savior from sin, God does not hold that grudge against us. We are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And James 1, 19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So God is calling us to be slow to anger, just like how he is slow to anger. The fits of anger and the quick outbursts, that comes from ourselves. That's not coming from God. We can have a righteous anger like God's when we are passionate about the same things God is passionate about. Angry against sin expressed in a healthy way. Hate and anger can be neutralized through the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. When someone gives you their worst, give them your best. Kill them with kindness. Jesus says in Matthew 5.38-40, You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. This is the Bible verse that Selena Gomez quoted. Let the haters hate. Romans 12, 19-21 says, Never take your own revenge, beloved. But leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We can trust that our enemies will get what they deserve because God is the judge and God is the avenger. We are called to love. We follow the fifth commandment by loving others. Can you imagine supplying for your enemies instead of fighting back? Like when someone cuts you off in traffic, instead of like giving them the bird and yelling out the window, getting fist fight, instead of doing that, oh, just give them the wave and slow down. Give them plenty of space. Just like let them cruise, give them tons of, give them the road. Or when you're at work and customer is just furious mad and they're just making threats and not wanting to pay, just smile and be like, thank you for sharing your concerns. How may I help you? You know, like 
When you combat hate with love, the enemies do not know what to do. They are expecting and they actually want you to go down to their level. They want you to fight back. And when you don't, it is like pouring burning coals onto their head. They don't know what to do. It, it drives them crazy, but it's in a good way. It's crazy love. And overcoming evil with good is not natural, but it takes two to have a fight. God calls us to love others always, to kill them with kindness. Matthew 5, 43 through 45 says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. No one deserves to be murdered. And no one deserves to be hated, which is murder of the heart. Our job as Christians is to love others. Love is patient. Love is kind. God is love, and we love because he first loved us. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. When you hold on to your anger, your anger holds on to you. Let's let go, forgiving our enemies. Let's kill them with kindness, just like God has done to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your forgiveness of our sins. We thank you that you do not hold grudges against us. God, we thank you that you are offering your son, Jesus, as our savior from sin. God, I pray that everyone here today would know your love and know your forgiveness. God, I pray that you would help us to come to know you more, to become more like you. God, I pray that you would get rid of this murder of the heart, God. I pray that our anger and hatred would not lead to sinful actions. God, I pray that we would not murder as well. God, pray that you'd guard and protect us, purify us from all unrighteousness. God, we thank you that you love us and you can work in us through the Holy Spirit. God, help us to kill others with kindness. Help this anger to not be held on to us. Help us to let go and let you take over. We love you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Amen.